Good morning. For those of you who don't know, I'm Vice Mayor Dennis Kavanaugh, and I'm here on behalf of the City of Mesa and Mayor John Giles, who is out of the country now. So as acting mayor, this is uh, for the next week or so, it's, uh, it's my privilege and honor to be here with you today. Uh, this topic is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart, being a former board member for A New Leaf, as well as the, the Child Crisis Center. And uh, the importance of uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month is something really that's critical and key for us to educate our community about. And I'm really proud to uh, invite you and welcome you here to the Banner Simulation Medical Center. This is truly one of the gems of the East Valley medical community, and in fact, our entire region. This simulation center functions as a, a virtual hospital that Banner Health uses to help train physicians and nurses before they treat actual patients. And it's one of the largest of its centers of its kind in the entire world and has elevated medical education efforts here in Arizona to new levels. With computerized mannequins as patients, as you see behind me, this uh, 55,000 square foot facility has many of the features that are found in any Banner Health hospital, including an intensive care unit, a medical surgical unit, two operating rooms with virtual operation capabilities, a neonatal care center, and this emergency room here. We'd like to thank Banner for making the facility available to us today. We picked this emergency room to serve as a dramatic visual representation of what can happen to domestic violence victims when their situation escalates. But truly, our goal is to make sure they don't end up here. In Mesa, our police department leads our Family Advocacy Center in a collaborative approach to investigating and intervening in domestic violence cases. The Advocacy Center has an on-scene crisis intervention. Our center uses the lethality assessment during the interviews, and the questions and answers are actually used in the officer's uh, narrative reports. Now, to tell us more about the benefits of lethality assessments as a tool that is truly helping to save lives, it's my pleasure to welcome Scottsdale Mayor Jim Lane, who is the chair of the Maricopa Association of Governments. Mayor Lane. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh. We'll do this. And good morning again. Thank you, Mayor Kavanaugh, for inviting us here to your district, which I understand, and to this great facility. Um, so I'd have to say MAG's Regional Council is dedicated to an ambitious goal, and that is to end domestic violence. And on September 30th, I signed a resolution supporting October as <coughs> Domestic Violence Awareness Month. In your materials today, you'll find a copy of that resolution and the two, 2015 Domestic Violence Awareness Month calendar as well. And there are events happening throughout the region because of domestic violence affects all of our communities. I encourage you to attend the events and to invite others to do the same. Every year in Arizona, more than 100 people, most often women, lose their lives due to intimate partner or family violence. Many more of them end up in emergency or trauma rooms similar to this one here. In fact, this is an astounding statistic for just about anyone who's considered it. 40% of the women seeking treatment in hospital emergency rooms are there because of injuries inflicted by a current or former spouse or partner. Now that's over one in three. It's an incredible statistic. It's a price paid too often by too many victims and many of those victims remain in danger. Reducing that danger by helping victims become aware of the risk they are in is a focus of our press conference here today. One of the ways our communities are reducing that risk is through an evaluation tool known as lethality assessment. This assessment usually consists of about a dozen questions, ranging from whether the abuser has ever threatened bodily harm to whether they own a, a firearm. One question has to do with strangulation, which is now considered one of the highest indicators of whether a victim is at risk of being killed. Lethality assessments are a type of danger score in which police or advocates ask a, vis a victim a series of questions to identify high risk factors and to raise awareness of victims regarding their personal level of danger. 
If a victim answers yes to more than four of these questions, she is considered to be in a dangerous situation. These assessments offer a real potential to prevent domestic violence fatalities. They can re reduce repeat calls to the same household and increase the safety of both officers and victims. The assessment can also, the assessment can help officers better understand the dangers and provide additional information to the victim about how to access shelters. In my own community of Scottsdale, our police department was also one of the first to include lethality assessments as standard practice when responding to domestic violence calls. These assessments become recognized as an important tool for not only law enforcement, but for prosecutors as well. Under a new Arizona law that took effect just this past July, judges now have the authority to use the assessments when setting bail and charging offenders. In March, the Arizona State Legislature passed House Bill 2467, which expands the factors that the court must consider when determining a method of release or the amount of bail. Under the new propositions, the law requires a judicial offend officer to consider the results of the risk or lethality assessment in a domestic violence victim presented to the court. In a moment, we'll hear from a Phoenix prosecutor familiar with how these assessments communicate vital information needed to obtain convictions and impose appropriate sentences. In summary, lethality assessments are an important tool for victims to engage with police and recognize the breadth of their situation. They are an important tool for police to collect the right kinds of evidence and information. And they are important for prosecutors when it comes to charging offenders. I want to recognize the important work of the MAG Regional Domestic Violence Council in getting lethality assessments included as a recommended best practice in the regional protocol model. The DV Council plays an important role for bringing together elected officials, healthcare professionals, prosecutors, police service providers, and private funders. The, court, the council provides a forum for communication and coordinated action to effectively address, prevent, and eradicate domestic violence in the MAG region. It is now my pleasure to introduce the incoming chair of the Regional Domestic Violence Council, Apache Junction Vice Mayor Robin Barker. Robin. Good morning. I think this one. Yeah. There we go. Thank you, Mayor Lane. And thank you for your leadership in addressing domestic violence in the region. It's important to have champions like you supporting this type of work. And as you mentioned, Scottsdale was one of the first communities to start using lethality assessments. In a few short years, many cities and towns in the region have adopted the practice, and lives are saved as a result. Significant changes can begin with just a few champions who are dedicated to making a difference. You are all here because you are committed to that change, to making that difference. Thank you for the lives you touch and the lives you save. Domestic violence is not confined to any one community. It affects every city and town, no matter the size or the geography. Some communities have discovered that law enforcement responds to the same house month after month, year after year. This highly repetitive need for officer assistance represents an incredible cost to the criminal justice system. And more importantly, it creates a greater and more imminent risk for the victims involved. All of our communities need to become equipped with better tools in order to respond more effectively to domestic violence. Lethality assessments are one of those tools. 
the lethality assessment was incorporated into the region's misdemeanor protocol model by MAG's Regional Domestic Violence Council in 2014. Following their annual model evaluation, with extensive input from law enforcement, prosecutors, and victim advocates. The model sets best practices for the most effective ways to arrest and prosecute domestic violence crimes. It enables consistency in responding to domestic violence calls among agencies throughout the region, and it has now been included in the Maricopa County Attorney's Office protocol model for felonies. It took a few innovative communities, such as Glendale, Scottsdale, Phoenix, and Mesa, to start using the assessment in order to provide necessary feedback on its effectiveness. They all reported positive impacts and began to assist in training other communities. Since 2014, a number of communities have benefited from using these lethality assessments. This would not have been possible without those first few who blazed the trail. Nor would it have been possible without a collaborative regional approach. It takes all of us working together to make a difference in each of our neighborhoods. I strongly urge the leadership in those communities who have not yet incorporated lethality assessments in their public safety departments to do so. It can and does save lives. When the MAG Regional Domestic Violence Council was first formed in 1999, it was the largest coordinating body in the country. Today, years later, we are still leading the country through innovations like the use of lethality assessments and the region's protocol model. In addition to these, we continue to develop new approaches in partnership with the governor's office that funds the work and the people who are working in the field that really keep it real. Currently, we are mapping out how domestic violence cases are transferred between municipalities and counties. Similar to our work with lethality assessments, we are striving to find ways to make the work more efficient, cost effective in order to reach more people, and to develop an effective system for case information and knowledge sharing. We are sharing best practices. We are asking ourselves the tough questions and pushing to always improve the region's response to domestic violence. We are providing the tools, the training, and the contacts that make this change possible. I would like to thank and acknowledge the expertise and efforts of my colleagues and staff who serve on the council. All of us working together are making the system level changes that are needed to end domestic violence, one person at a time. I would like to introduce Amy Offenberg, prosecutor from the city of Phoenix, and she's going to explain to us how these lethality assessments are used when it comes to prosecution. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Barker, and I want to congratulate you on your sending to the chairmanship of the uh, Domestic Violence Council and let you know that I look forward to continuing to work with you on uh, ending domestic violence in Maricopa County. This year, the legislature unanimously passed a bill that mandates that judges determining bail consider the results of lethality assessments in setting the bail amount. While protecting the safety of victims was defined as one of the purposes of bail previously, there was nothing specific in the statute regarding victim safety that judges needed to look at in making a bail determination. In 2011, the Phoenix Police Department started using lethality assessments in all domestic violence investigations. The assessment used by the Phoenix Police Department consists of four questions. The first, asks whether the victim has been threatened or intimidated by the defendant. Next, 
Police inquire whether the defendant demands the victim does things and verifies that they have been done. Police also ask the victim to describe the most frightening or worst event, event with the defendant. Finally, police want to know whether the victim has ever made a desire to leave known, and if so, what the reaction was. The lethality assessment has given both prosecutors and the court valuable insight into the relationships between our victims and our defendants. The legislature has now given us another tool to help protect victims. When a judge hears statements such as, two weeks ago, after I told him I was done with him, he squirted lighter fluid on my bed with me on it and lit it, but I got off before it burned. Or, every day when I get off work, he wants me to be home in 30 minutes, and if I don't make it in 30 minutes, he becomes very demanding. Or, he has told me that if I leave him, he would cut me and gut me before the police could arrive. Or, you can try to leave, but you will not get out of here alive. It is hard for a judge to ignore. As a result, we have seen higher bond amounts in cases where there is an indication of controlling and potentially lethal behavior. Recently, I learned that the victim from a case I prosecuted as a misdemeanor was killed by her abuser. It is the first time in 16 years that I have been prosecuting domestic violence cases that a victim on one of my cases has become a fatality. The victim was 74 years old. The defendant, her son. On the day she filed the misdemeanor report in August of 2014, the victim told the officers that her son had been beating her every day for a month, that he took away her cell phone and monitored her calls on the landline, and that he put keys around her ankle so that he could hear her moving throughout the house. On the day of this incident, he assaulted her off, off and on from 9 o'clock in the morning until he fell asleep that night. She was then able to escape and run to a guard shack at the apartment complex where police were called. A year later, he killed her and then killed himself. I hope that's the last time I hear such news about a domestic violence victim. With better tools such as lethality assessments, we continue to be able to better protect victims and hold offenders accountable. I'd now like to introduce uh, Chief Black with the Glendale Police Department, who is also making a difference in the domestic violence world. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you for your remarks and, more importantly, your commitment to the work with MAD, MAG Regional Domestic Violence Council. You may represent one community as a prosecutor, but you represent us all on the DV Council. I'm here today because I believe two things. The first is that domestic violence is wrong, and we must do everything we can to stop it. The second is I believe that lethality assessments are a critical tool we can use in our efforts to stop domestic violence. We will always have the challenges of not having enough funding or time, but we must always improve the way we hold offenders accountable and keep victims safe. In Glendale, we were one of the first communities to pioneer the use of lethality assessments. Our own tool was developed by Sergeant Beimler with the input of our detectives and research of best practices from throughout the country. Since we implemented lethality assessments in 2013, officers have been better equipped to establish rapport with the victim and collect better evidence. Our prosecutors are able to use this evidence to get more convictions. Our judges are able to determine more appropriate sentencing. And our victim advocates are better able to provide more services that meet the victim's needs giving them the support they need to testify and see that justice is served. As a law enforcement professional for 35 years, I can tell you just how important this tool is to police officers. Being able to sit down with a victim and ask the questions in a danger assessment gives officers a chance to gather information and better understand the dynamics that contrib contributed to the crime they're investigating. We find that the exchange allows officers to exhibit more empathy toward the victim, provide greater detail in their reports, and ultimately have a greater success in their desire to meet the needs of the victim and hold the offender accountable. 
Every officer comes into this work with a desire to help people and make their communities safer. Home is a place where everyone should feel safe and free from violence. The credit for developing and implementing this assessment tool belongs to an amazing team of dedicated individuals committed to making a difference in the lives of victims. These efforts have resulted in the Glendale Police Department receiving recognition with the 2014 Department of Justice Crime Victim Service Awards for Innovation and Victim Services, and next week we'll receive the Honorable Mention Award for the, from the 2015 International Association of Chiefs of Police Enforcement Military Cooperation Award for our work with Luke Air Force Base. Recognition is always nice, but it pales in comparison to the reward of doing life-changing work on behalf of the people we serve. It's now my absolute honor to hand the microphone over to Julie. Uh, she will tell her story, her personal story, her very personal hard story about domestic violence in her life. Thank you. I want to say what an honor it is to be here today. Hi, my name is Julie, and this is my story. May of 2001, my abuser and I were over-the-road truck drivers together as a team. We were halfway between Kingman, Arizona, and the Hoover Dam when my abuser, who was driving at the time, became irate and began attacking me verbally and physically. I knew that he was not going to stop hurting me, and I had no way to escape, for we were moving at 45 miles per hour. I was desperate, trying to find a way to get him to stop the truck so that I could escape and get away. I opened the door, thinking and hoping that it would startle him and he would stop, or at least slow down enough to where I could get out. It didn't faze him, and he kept going. Yanking me back towards him, yelling and screaming. I thought in my terrified mind that the truck door had closed behind me, but I soon found out that it didn't. He hit me one more time so hard that it knocked me out the door. The last thing I remember was seeing the pavement coming up very fast. I woke up five days later at St. Joseph's Hospital after being evac from Kingman with multiple head fractures and traumatic brain trauma. While I was unconscious, he was able to convince the doctors and the police that I had jumped out of the truck on my own trying to commit suicide. No one believed me at the time because he had already won them over. The years go by and the abuse continued. By now, he was referring to me as his slave to everyone we knew, claiming that he was the king over me and that he could and would do whatever he wanted. To prove this, he would throw me out of the house with no money, no clothes except for what I was wearing, and nowhere to go. During these times, I would live on the street, losing hope by every passing minute. To cope with the abuse, the loneliness, the fear, and the hopelessness, I turned to substance abuse. Then I met someone who spoke to me straight up and honestly about the drugs and about the domestic violence who saw that I was on the verge of giving up completely. I began to really listen to what he had to say because I could tell that this person was not judging me, but that he truly wanted to help. This person opened a whole new door for me and told me that this is a path that you should be on because you deserve so much better. That person was Officer Price with the Glendale Police Department. Because of him, I'm going on three years of sobriety, and I'm a much safer place. So thank you, Officer Price. Thank you. Because I worried so much about my two sons, I would go back to my abuser. I had no way to support them at the time, so he would keep them from me until I gave in and returned. Of course, the abuse would continue, but I would stay because I knew I had to protect my boys the only way I knew how and that was to take the abuse myself instead of him hurting him. 
In July of 2014, my 11-year-old son was, got super excited one night about a preview of the movie, The Giver. He was yelling, Mom, Mom, look. It's The Giver. Please, we have to see that. My little man had just finished reading the book in school, and he was very animated, telling me all about it. His dad came running out of his bedroom, extremely angry, yelling and screaming at my son to shut up. He began calling me names and telling him to quit acting so stupid over a, a movie. He even asked him what was wrong with his intellect. I had just sat down on the table, and he sat down, still screaming at my son, who was standing next to him at the time, scared, crying, and so confused at why he was being treated so badly. My son turned to run away from his dad, knocking the water bottle over onto him. That's when his dad stabbed him hard in the thigh with a fork. And then he picked up a heavy bottle of salad dressing and threw it at him and hit him right in the back. I reached the phone, called 911. That's when he knocked the phone out of my hand, put his hand on my face and pushed me to the ground. He then put his knee into my chest and to my neck and told me that if I made that call, that he would be gone with the children before anyone could ever get there, and I would never see them again. That is one of my biggest fears, and he knew it. So I waited until the next day, went to my counseling appointment, which he had no idea I was doing, because if he did, I would be forbidden to go. I told my counselor what happened and asked her to please help us. She told me she had to make a report to DCS, and I told her to please do so. Do whatever it takes to get my children away from the abuse. I knew that because of my past substance abuse, DCS would be more than likely take my children away until I could prove to them that I was sober and stable. But I knew in my heart that that was a sacrifice that I had to make for my boys are my world. The very next day, they were taken into DCS custody. The Peoria police were called by the DCS workers because my abuser had become very aggressive with them. I remember the officers telling me that there was a good place that I could go, where I would finally be safe and get the support and the resources that my boys and I so desperately needed. They gave me the number to DV stop, and within just a couple of hours, I was a participant of a very wonderful domestic violence shelter. I completed the program within four months, was accepted into the transitional program, and we now have our own apartment since November of last year. Since being at this DV shelter, I have learned many things. I have learned what support, compassion, caring is all about. Having someone stand beside you, believing in you, and above all, giving you hope. I now have sole custody of my children with supervised visits with their dad, with a court-approved agency. We see our counselors once a week, all three of us, and every two weeks we go for family sessions. I've been diagnosed with severe anxiety and PTSD, and so have both of my sons. But we are healing and growing stronger every day and will continue to do so. What I would like to say to all of the domestic violence victims out there is there is so much support and resources now that all you have to do is put your hand out. Someone is going to grab that hand and they're going to show you so many ways to get started with a new, better, and more positive and safe life. Use your voice and you will be heard. Find your true, authentic self, and you will find hope again. I did, and because I did, I can now stand up and tell the world that I am a strong woman. For I have fallen and I've cried. I've been angry and afraid. I've been put down and let down. But when I was hurting, so alone and lost, my world nothing but darkness and fear, I always found a way to keep going, for I 
am a strong woman, and a strong woman never gives up. Thank you. I want to thank Julie for sharing her story. It's difficult for us to hear, as I'm sure it was difficult for her to tell. So we thank her for her bravery and for being the voice of so many other survivors in our state. We hope her story will help other victims realize not only the danger they may be faced with, but more importantly, that they are not alone and help is available. You know, as cities and as government, as a region and as a state, it's, 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 we always are focused on livability within our communities. It's an interesting component when you talk about saving lives. It extends beyond just a life and death situation, but saving a life from the trauma of injury and of fear and of potential death-defying incidences. But in any case, I, I just want to say that that's an important component for every city and every community, and this is what this is all about, too. So thank you again, Julie, very, very much for your story. <clears throat> you know, at this time, I'd like to ask Chief Black and Julie to come forward. Once again, we do have some additional items we want to communicate here. If we have somebody, like... <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> this is Officer Randy Price. Surprise. <laughs> um, I can say that uh, when I first met her, um, it was a bad day for her. It was um, abuse had really gotten to her, drug abuse at that. Um, she told me her story. And then, you know, we, we hear the stories all the time. We hear the same stories over and over. And then I met her on a different day, and she told me, hey, I'm, I'm clean. I haven't used in so many days. But it was the same story. It was the same concern for her two kids. So at that point, it was more of, you know, well, what's really going on here? What, what is it? And I, I told her that her main thing is that she doesn't need to do this for herself. She needs to do it for her boys. That's all it was about. And every time, it was the same thing. Do it for your boys. And then I ran into her a couple more times, and then I started actually getting calls at our communication center to where she was requesting to speak to me. Um, so I, I'd ask where she was at. I'd go out there and talk to her. And then, you know, it eventually got to where it was less and less that I'd get called, less and less. And then I actually had stopped hearing from her. And I, I won't say that I went above and beyond because I didn't. I did anything, in our, anything that any officer in our department would have done. That's what we do. And... Our, our job is to help. You know, not everybody's a criminal, not everybody's a drug addict. Our job is to help people. That's what it is. Thank you, Officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for your showing of your support here. And Julie, once again, thank you for being here with us. And Officer Price, thank you for doing your job And as you, as you, as you reflect upon it. Because I'm certain that it's more than that. And it's meaningful for all of us to, to have you here. So thank you so very much for that. So that does, um, that does conclude our press conference for this morning. I do appreciate everyone for coming and showing that support, as I mentioned. And uh, everybody, have a good day. <laughs>